Are we? Yes. Where are we? Here. Why are we here? Not entirely clear. We are misfits thrust into existence by random chance with no hints at all as to how we're supposed to make sense of it all. It's immensely bizarre. Here we are. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Here We Are podcast. Today, I am back at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, talking with Liz Derryberry. Thank you so much for joining me today, Liz. Thank you for having me. So, uh, first off, I, I guess tell a little bit. Uh, we're going to be talking birds on this. Yes, episode. we will be talking about birds. Yeah, I have. Uh, let me get this out of my mind first. Uh, Derryberry. Maybe the best last name that I've ever. Do you get this a Thank lot? You. I do get this a lot. It's people are fascinated by this name and it's helpful when you want people to remember you. Not so much when you don't. <laughs> <laughs> because it's because Terry Berry is not your husband's name. You're nope. like, no, thank you. No, nope, I'm nope. sticking with the, this. It's too memorable. It's uh, yeah, it's too. I'm surprised he didn't take your name. I, you know, we actually talked about that. that well, we had that conversation. I want your name. Can I have your name? <laughs> sure. It's made up. That's why it's a fun name. It's it's, it's a made yep, up name. Yep. Four but, brothers got together in Pennsylvania and they changed their name from Darren Berger. To Dairy Berry. And <laughs> well, so there's when a, was it? Yeah, I know. It was probably in like the mid 1800s. I yeah. love these brothers. Yeah. So all Dairy wow. Berries are related. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's amazing. All right. All right. Got that out of the way. You have an awesome name. Maybe the best one on the planet. Thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, tell everyone about your, your work and your background. Yeah. So I'm an evolutionary biologist who studies bird behavior. And I really probably am best known for my work on bird song. So I'm really interested in how birds use song, how songs change over time, why they change, and then what happens when they change. You know, how does communication break down? And then what sort of effects does that have on things like speciation, right? How new species are formed. Could we talk about the evolution of bird song, just the the the, the origin story as as uh, what are the varying theories? Yeah, so that's a great question. Actually, a paper just came out about acoustic communication um, last week that's really exciting, showing that acoustic communication is really widespread in vertebrates. So like basically when the first lung fish crawled out, right, and lungs developed, you had acoustic communication. So it's really widespread. So it's not unique to birds, um, but birds are probably the most studied when it comes to song or vocalizations because they're so beautiful, right? I mean, who doesn't love bird song? You know, it's really sweet, pure tone. It carries, right? It's a long distance signal. So you're meant to hear it at a long distance. Uh, and so people really enjoy that, right? That's, I mean, there's even studies showing that, you know, bird song promotes human health. The more song you have, in your environment, the happier you are. So, yeah. Really? <laughs> yep, yep. It's good stuff. Bird song's good for you. <laughs> How much happier? I, <laughs> I think any amount of increase in happiness these days is yeah, a win, right? <laughs> so we just need more birds everywhere? We just everywhere. need more birds everywhere. There yeah. has to be some sort of cap on that where a well, certain it's true. number of birds. It's true. I will tell you a number of people do tell me how much they dislike the mockingbird, right? That lives outside their house and wakes them up at 4 a.m., right? So it's true. There are replicating a, yeah. <laughs> a jackhammer song. Yes, exactly. Song or yes. Or a car alarm or, you know, all sorts of things uh, that they like to mimic. Car yep. alarm. <laughs> They like to mimic car alarms. Mm -hmm. Yes, that they is do. So unfortunate. Yes, it is. So you know, there are definitely you can have too much, but I would a just distance. make a law that says no more car alarms in areas that have mockingbirds exactly. because it's just not worth it. It's not their fault. Do car alarms work? remember when car alarms started in like the nineties? Yes. I do, unfortunately. Were like, yes. <laughs> they were very excited about this new yes. technology and now No, does they, anybody even use for it? A now? Year. Yeah. <laughs> uh and now they just teach mockingbirds yep. how to annoy the heck out of right? people. Exactly. Um that's <laughs> So th that's strange to me. I, I I don't want to get too hung up on car yeah. <laughs> on the car alarms. <laughs> it, it, it makes me think of um, of 
of uh, bower birds of how mm-hmm. of, of 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 how they'll they'll collect these uh, wonderful little trinkets around, or you try to film the things and they're stealing lenses and yeah, and... little bits of blue plastic <laughs> and yeah, yeah. So they yeah. love blue plastic. So mm-hmm. so water bottles uh, <laughs> yeah. hit the scene and they start collecting little blue caps and. And this guy's all the rage because he has the most blue caps. And then all the males are trying to copy and accrue the most blue caps. And then after, over time, the females are like, ah, I've seen the whole blue cap <laughs> thing before. Because now there's so many water bottles yep. that they're no longer the scarce yep. thing. So it's no longer impressive. There's no longer kind of this honest indicator of fitness when there's just blue caps abundant everywhere. Is something like that going on with a with a mockingbird, where once everything, once all of the mockingbirds know the uh, know the car alarm call that it's no longer impressive, or is it, or or is some of their uh, are some of their calls and songs more of like a coalitional kind of signal? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I don't know if anybody's asked that, so that sounds like a project to me. So, you know, we do know that mockingbirds. I just of, want them to stop. I know. Making I know. You're really like, can we encourage them to stop? Or is that going to have some cost for their sexiness? Right. I think is what you're asking. And so, yeah, no, I don't know. I feel like, I feel like they would be okay. Even if they didn't have it in their repertoire, I think females would still choose to mate with them. So okay. yeah. Yeah. So it's not, it's not a problem to try to reduce car alarms. <laughs> okay. So, so back to before I got, uh, um, sucked into that, yeah. uh, very interesting rabbit hole. What, so where were we? So, so some of the, um, well, I think it's so, actually, oh, oh yeah, so, yeah. so, so we were talking about all sorts of things, make calls, but probably bird calls might be the most well studied just because they're the most fun to, to study. There's all sorts of annoying, uh, sounds out there that critters make that maybe aren't as pleasant to the human ear, and and so we know we know probably a great deal more about bird song than some other species out there. That is definitely true, and birds are really interesting because these really pure tone songs that they make have sort of interesting, the ways that they do that are really interesting. So um, they have, you know, they can open and close their beak to sort of track the fundamental frequency of the sound that they're making. And that filters out all the harmonics. So they're real musicians, right? When they're singing, they're actively filtering their songs to create that pure tone. And that's pretty cool, right? So there's a lot of really neat research sort of understanding the biomechanical limitations um, that are placed on song and, and how they're singing. And of course, females find what's hard, sexy. And so there's strong female preferences for things that are hard to do with song. So like singing really rapidly with a wide frequency range, um, that's really sexy, right? And mm. females like that. So yeah. <laughs> Just difficult for difficulty's sake. Difficult for difficulty's sake, yeah. exactly, right? And so it can also kind of give... You know, there's a lot of work also showing um, females like songs that are well learned. So a lot of species, a lot of songbirds, right? They learn their song just like we learn our language, how to speak, right? We go sort of through babble, like babies babble. You know, only a mom can tell what a two-year-old is saying. Birds do the same thing. So they learn how to sing from listening to adults and their population, And that process they go through of practicing and listening to the mistakes that they make and correcting them, some are better at doing that than others. And so females really prefer songs that are basically learned better. So uh, a a brain's a difficult thing to build a and brain maintain. Is, yep. It's and it's uh, it, it's something that is uh, especially susceptible to. Um, uh, parasitic threats mm-hmm. and, and chemical things. pollution. And, yep. Right, and and, and so uh, an ability to learn is uh, is uh, again kind of this honest indicator of of brain health, which is uh, has to do with the brain, but also just probably the overall health of mm-hmm. the bird. It's it's probably because it's the most sensitive to chemicals, parasitic threat, whatever. It's, it's probably the, the easiest thing to evaluate. 
Exactly. Exactly. You're on it. Yeah. 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 Um, and so, you know, these things that we think about, you know, in my work, I'm really interested in also how birds change their song in response to like human disturbances. Right. So I do a lot of work thinking about noise pollution, for example, and how do birds navigate this sort of sensory pollutant in their environment, this, this altered soundscape, right? And so that's where, you know, my work kind of fits in and thinking about the evolution of song, right? Is how do sort of selective pressures from things like light pollution, noise pollution, all the sensory pollutants, how does that change how birds express the behavior and potentially even how it changes over time? Because if you can't get the sound out because there's so much noise pollution, now you're do you do? wasting yeah. energy and effort. Right. And that signal contains really important information, right? They're singing, right? It's a long distance signal, right? So it needs to go a long way. So that's really susceptible to, you know, wind and noise and anything that can kind of uh, modify or alter, disrupt the signal. And Females are listening for that, right? To detect and find a male. Other males are listening to that to sort of know where territory boundaries are, right? So song is a keep out signal as well as a come hither signal, right? It has sort of conflicting roles. Um, and as songs being transmitted, if we think about natural noise in the environment, right? We see that, you know, just across amphibians, insects, birds, right? We see variation in that in their acoustic signals to deal with natural noise like waterfalls and oceans right that sort of low frequency noise but in cities right that those noise pollution levels are even high. so this is now noise pollution right so it's not as necessarily as regular of a disruptor it varies in um, sort of the power, how much energy there is at different frequencies. And so we'll see that birds actively will change and alter their songs in a way to avoid what we call masking, right? So that's sort of keeping you from being able to detect the information that's in the signal. So they do things like they sing louder, right? It's like a, like a cocktail party, right? If you go to a party, Everybody starts talking and it gets really loud and you'll find that by the end of the night, you're kind of, you probably lost your voice, right? You're shouting, your voice has gone up in frequency. Birds do the same thing, right? They sing louder. And when it's like in downtown cities, right? Where there's lots of traffic noise. They also shift the frequency of their song up, right? So they're singing at higher frequencies. But this is good, right? Because it helps the signal get detected, but it can have consequences. So, if you shift your frequency up, your frequency range gets narrower, right? And I just said females like it when you sing fast and wide. So there's complications, right? There's consequences or costs for signaling your quality, your performance of the song when you're in a noisy environment. They, they basically have to kind of scream their yes. song over time. And then that's just, it's hard to evaluate. What's... Yeah. I think about like, like a political rally, right? If you're at a political rally, you start, if you have really complicated, you know, if you're like kind of um, trying to be very nuanced or smart and explaining your policy at a rally, nobody cares, right? They don't detect it. They don't understand it. You can't get that kind of rich information across in a rally, right? You just shout slogans, right? You just, you get to the heart of the matter. If you're a good communicator and noise, you're not saying anything nuanced, right? You're just shouting your message, right? So I think about the bird saying, basically, you know, keep out of my territory. It's like, keep out, keep out. Or it's like, um, it's like kids movie Nemo the little, with the seagulls and they're trying to get the fish. They're like, mine, 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 mine. They're saying the same thing over and over but it doesn't give you much information about maybe that individual. You lose that, you lose that info. Yeah. And how, how quickly are they able to pick up on these cues and adjust? So, so you, uh, you're a male, um, you're a male bird in what species are you generally studying? So the noise pollution work has been mainly in white crowned sparrows, which are, um, a very handsome little bird that lives on the West coast of yeah, North I mean, America. You're partial. I'm a little partial, but they have a black and white striped head, very sort of tuxedo esque kind of gray um, body. I think that they're very handsome. Aren't sparrows <laughs> the most abundant bird on earth? 
there are a lot of sparrows. It is true. Now, is it the most abundant? I would have to think about that. I mean, populations are going down, right? We've lost 3 billion birds over the last 30 years. Really? In North America. Oh, yeah. Populations are crashing. So 3 billion. What did we start with? Well, 3 billion more than that. <laughs> Start with six billion, they're yeah. in half. No, no, we had what was it in the seventies? I want to say I have to go back and look at what the counts were. But looking at sort of just bird abundance counts since the seventies, populations have declined by that much. Even as we're probably getting better at, uh, yep. at accounting them. Yeah, even common things like robins, right, are in free fall. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. Um, okay. So that so, was a depressing note. Yes. Oh yeah. I mean, I talk, yeah. <laughs> I talk with people that study reality. Yes, so yeah. it's, it can be a depressing thing sometimes. Yeah. So white crowned sparrows were very abundant and they're still yeah. like common. They're not threatened or endangered and they do love cities. Like they'll sing in downtown San Francisco, downtown Seattle, Portland. You'll find a white crowned sparrow pretty much everywhere. Uh, yeah. How many different sparrows are there? Do you know? Yeah, there's many species of sparrows. Yeah, yeah there's hundreds. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So and different kinds of sparrows. That's a whole nother. We could go into the. <laughs> maybe we line, will. Yeah. Um. So the white crowned sparrow. Your your uh, you got your bachelor pad. You're all set up. You're ready to attract a mate, and then. That day is when construction starts on the corner, like right under your tree. What what sort of what action are they going to take? Yeah. yeah, what do you do? So you you ramp up the amplitude of your song. You, see, you sing really loud. Do you shift the frequency? Now, this is an ongoing question that we have, right? How much do they change the frequency of their song in real time, right? And we do see some slight changes that individuals can do. So they will kind of shift the frequency up and narrow the bandwidth. But the biggest change we see is actually over generations. So we see, for example, over the last 30 years, as noise levels have increased in San Francisco, over time, we've lost some song types. So song types that were sort of lower in frequency have just disappeared. Ones that were higher in frequency have shifted up. So that's that kind of cultural evolution, right? Where you copy the song that you can detect, then that's the song type that increases in frequency over time. So it's not genetic evolution, but it's cultural evolution. So you see this shift that's consistent with the sort of learning, right? As the mechanism of change. So you asked about how quickly, right? So we thought for a long time that it was a very slow response, right? That you needed to have sort of over generations, you would see this shift in song structure that would allow you to sort of have a song that could transmit well in noise. And then COVID-19 happened, right? And it got quiet. It got really quiet. And we thought, what are they doing, right? Did they because if it's slow, they should still be singing the same way that they were before, right? It should take time. It should be like next year that we can see any sort of shift in the song traits. But that's not true. Overnight, we saw a huge change in their songs. So they dropped the amplitude of their songs. They were singing much more softly than they were before. So almost, you know, it's like 6 dB, 7 dB drop. Um, in that. So if you think about right sound, it's on a logarithmic scale, 6 dB is a doubling of sound pressure levels. So that's a really big change in the amplitude of their songs. And they also increase the frequency range of their songs. So they got sexier overnight. It was very cool to see this big sort of landscape level across the city and every song population that we study, they change their song very quickly. Without having to learn, uh, without having to um, have the kind of cultural transmission, they, they were able to just yes. improvise? Yeah, it completely changed what we thought they were doing, right? I, I, I went in thinking, you know, I had all these predictions, right, about all of our experimental work shows this, right? So we've done hand rearing experiments where we've, you know, raised them in the lab with noise. We've done noise playbacks where as adults, you know, we play noise at them as adults uh, in captivity and in the wild, and they really didn't change their song that much. Noise went away, huge change, right? So it was really pretty exciting to see just how um, 
how well they could respond to a reduction in noise pollution, right? It makes you realize, right? You think about if you go out and mitigate pollution, if you mitigate disturbance, you know, you, you try to um, prevent, you know, re restore habitats, that it takes a long time for species to respond, right? It can take a make long, long time and people get impatient, right? I'm like, hey, look, noise, you make it quiet. They respond immediately. You see this huge change, right? And wildlife behavior, which was, made me happy. <laughs> you know, it's a positive outcome. So. That's so interesting. So, so they lost the oldies over, mm -hmm. over yeah. time, those yeah. old classics yeah, that we all right. knew and loved. Yeah. And that, it, I mean, my first question about that was, was there still, I mean, females are still comparing males mm. to one another. Yes, so you, even if everything's at a higher frequency, you're still right. evaluating mm -hmm. something. Right. So, so did, did their, did their music. So if, and now that we know that they are not just learning, but they're doing, they're mm -hmm. able to do a fair amount of improvising on the fly. How, how saw, uh, how, how often do new songs pop? How often does something else hit the billboard charts? That is a great question, right? And it varies across species. So in white crown sparrows, there's sort of the classic, how do I explain this? They're really conservative, right? They like what they like. And so what happens is that they have this really strong geographic pattern of song variation. So they have dialects just like we do, right? So you can tell somebody from Texas as you can from somebody from Boston, right? Like at least you could, it's gotten harder over time, but there's these really sort of strong regional patterns to how we um, speak. And so in white crown sparrows, it's the same way. They have these very strong dialects. So all the males in a population sing one song and they sing the same song and they sing it very similarly. And it's very different from males in the next population over where they have a different song that they sing. So there's a lot of, there's very low variation within a population and, and much greater variation between populations. And they do this on a very small scale. So like in San Francisco, right? Big bustling city, they can have, there's like three or four different dialects right there, right? So on a very small spatial scale. And if you have to remember, right? Birds fly, they can go long distances. Uh, so it's pretty remarkable to have that level of structure, right? Like, cause they could easily go into the other dialect, right? But they don't. So you have this really sort of strong pattern of behavioral variation, which is neat. So no, so new songs don't crop up that often, right? Because if you get a sort of a, a stranger song in the population, they don't tend to copy, like young don't copy that song. They tend to copy what they hear most often. And as, as pollution I mean, this this must be a much more difficult thing to measure, but um, you, you you probably do. Um, I how do you measure female hearing? Because so mm -hmm. so if if males are okay, so we already kind of discussed the uh, males are are being selected for by females mm -hmm. uh, often. This uh, uh, female choice. It, sort of being the filter and driving force of, yeah. of what uh, and song quality being an indicator of, of brain and vocal health being an indicator of overall health. But there would have been selection pressure for ability to detect um, a song as well. So <clears throat> is there, are there because if you're a female that detects really well, then you're going to have better offspring and, mm -hmm. and, um, and going to have daughters that, that mm -hmm. inherit that trait. Um, so is, is that something that you're able to test or, or measure ability to evaluate song? That, so, so yes, there are the methods to do that. I don't do it. But what's really interesting is that for a very long time, this is kind of how science works, right? Is that you have to make certain assumptions to move forward with one field. And that at a certain point, some bright young thing goes, wait a second, let's look at these assumptions that we're making. And then you'll see the sort of pivot in the field and the people start studying those assumptions and it opens up a whole new line of research. And so 
bird hearing is one of those things. So for a long time, and if you look at sort of traditional textbooks, there's a general understanding, oh, birds just all hear the same way. They hear about the same way humans do, right? They have sort of a similar um, sensitivity to frequencies, right? And their ability to detect that sound and noise, right, is similar. This was sort of the idea. And that there's some outliers like owls or other things that maybe have different types of hearing, depend, you know, that are indicative of the ways that they forage, for example, like how they use sound. Now, that's a pretty big assumption, right? And so interestingly, work over the last couple of decades and really recently, especially in um, this uh, Jeff Lucas's lab at Purdue has started to reveal that that's just not true. There's a huge amount of variation in how birds hear, even among closely related songbirds, and that even differences in se the sexes within a bird, that males and females will be different, and <laughs> that their ability to hear, their receptivity to sound changes with the seasons, right? So you can imagine they get better and more sensitive to detecting like conspecifics when it's breeding time, right? And that that kind of goes away during wintering time. And so that is really new work that's been coming out. And luckily he's done some work on white crowned sparrows. <laughs> so that's allowed us to use some of his models for how they hear in estimating things like how far the song travels, right? So we don't necessarily have to look at the signal. We can also use information about how they hear that song to detect or to, to calculate communication distance, right? So how far the song can transmit in different types of noise, right? So that's been really helpful, but I didn't do the measurements, yeah. Do birds have um, ear hairs for, for hearing? How do they? You know, I don't know. That's a good question. I'm just, uh, cause some species yeah. like fish will like regenerate their hearing or, or yeah. have new, have new growth yeah. within there. Whereas like humans don't, for example, right. I'm curious yeah. if. No, I don't know. That's a good mm -hmm. question. Um, all right. Uh, so, so do males have, <clears throat> do males have the, uh, the sort of sensitivity that females have as well? I wouldn't think it would take as fine tune of hearing just simply for knowing just where different territories are, but you, you would need it to be replicating yeah, the song. Yeah, I, I believe, I believe what Jeff has shown, and of course there's many, many, many species out there, right? There's over 10,000 species of birds. But for what he's looked at, I believe he's finding that females tend to be more sensitive than males, especially during the breeding season. And I think that those differences tend to go away then when it's not breeding season, right? They become more similar. But we'd have to look that up. That's my memory of it, at least. And I would love to get a grant. We actually wrote a grant together that NSF did not fund. So we're just going to note that NSF. right now. NSF. Well, you're in luck because the, <laughs> the only people that watch this show is the NSF. Oh, really? Specifically <laughs> just to hand out grant after grant and wouldn't to that be wonderful? That was the truth. But we actually, Jeff and I got together and said, wow, look at this song. It's really different. And we know how the signal varies with noise across a sort of urban rural gradient. But we don't know anything about the receiver, right? We have all this information about the signaler, but not the receiver. And so to really understand sort of the biological consequences of this signal variation, we need to know if there's the differences in how they're detecting it. Like maybe birds in urban areas are more or less less sensitive to noise, right? So maybe that's not as big of a deal. Maybe they're hard at hearing and noise. It's not as big of a deal, right? And we don't we don't know that. So you found a hole in our understanding. <laughs> um, so I, I'm curious with the so so we've we've discussed that populations are crashing. Mm -hmm. and, and also at the same time, there's there's lots more noise pollution, more more than there's ever been. How related are those? Because there's a lot of factors going on. There's there's all sorts of habitat loss and and other there's there's uh, I don't know how much more pollution there is than there was in say the 70s or say so. the 70s was kind of rough it was kind of rough but but there was less people to be polluting yeah. so i don't yeah. know how, if, if, if there's if been many wins worse. right the whole you know silent spring there's been many wins with reducing 
certain types of chemical pollution, but there's others that I think we're still learning how they affect like mercury and lead, right? How they affect bird song and, and, and just whole ecosystems. Right. And I like to think of birds as like the canary in the coal mine, right? That if you, we know so much about them and they're so sensitive to environmental disturbances. And so you can kind of detect, right. Acoustically, these shifts in whole environment, you know, soundscapes or in ecosystems that are going on just by monitoring who's singing, right? Which species are singing, how many different species, right? So this is sort of this move to sort of use birds as this sort of, you know, uh, way to sort of watch and monitor what's going on. So yeah, no, they're, they're powerful that way. Oh, oh well, because I also imagine there'd be, uh, considering a, uh, sparrows probably once a word uh, or sorry, once a, once a year for mm -hmm. mating season with sparrows yeah, I, in I North imagine. America. Yeah. And so uh, there's, there's, there, there must be some sort of environmental cue or something where, where females, uh, it's, uh, when is it? Is it like early spring or late winter or something yep, typically? Yeah. And things are shifting, right? I mean, this is sort of a global pattern, right? If you have these shifts in these cues that are used by organisms, animals and plants, right? Knowing when to breed, knowing when to leave, right? That are really important. And so you get these sort of mismatches between, for example, when birds arrive on the breeding ground and when you have the highest sort of insect output, right? And so you have to these sort of disconnects, these, 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 um, you know, global change has caused a lot of these, uh, disconnects that are having pretty significant fitness consequences. Right. And so, and you see some adjustments, right. You do see animals changing things like, uh, for example, body size in birds has been decreasing over time. This has been shown in both sort of North American migrants as well as in uh, tropical resident birds. Um, so this is yeah. across most species yeah. of birds. Yeah. So these widespread shifts of, of uh, body size. And there's some thought that that might have to do with temperature, right? Smaller body, less thermal inertia, maybe uh, easier to dissipate, get rid of heat. Um, it could also have to do with just maybe facilitating things like flight, right? And migrating earlier. Um, I don't know. That's the question, right? So there's lots of studies that are coming out showing this pattern, but what the mechanism is behind it is still in question. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess, and in, in then kind of going into, uh, so, so setting up, uh, setting up the best time for mating season. So, so mm. roughly, so when you talked about how many insects are in the environment, I imagine if you're about to grow a new life in your body, you probably want a yeah. lot of abundant yes. uh, resources. And yep. after laying the eggs and, and them, them hatching, you want uh, a lot of stuff nearby that you can, that you can go and uh, provide for your offspring. Mm -hmm. So, so you have um so so you have this kind of time and place that makes sense that is maybe changing with um with uh global warming and environmental pressures to move that to a, a slightly different time um but how much i'm 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 curious the reason why i ask about environmental triggers is yeah. is are are there females that uh, I, I know females in some species, a male will do something that will cue a female mm -hmm. um, to uh, uh, to uh, start ovulating. Yeah, sing. They sing. That's that's what song. It's really so so for that. so song so mm -hmm. song does so so. Yeah. Uh, I guess that's what I was trying to get at was yeah. was is there cues in the environment that flips uh, that makes females go. Oh, okay. It's it's time to. I'm I'm getting revved up right now. I I yeah. better go and get myself a male. Or is it that they hear something within a male that flips on that? So it's lots of different types of cues, right? So okay. we think about light cues, temperature, uh, food resources, and song, and that kind of varies with what kind of species you are, right? So some things that. Um, birds that sort of have this sort of very specific breeding times, it's often cued 
by light and also then the acoustic cue of the male singing, right? So there's sort of this combination effect. Um, there's others that are more cued by food appearance. So these sort of eruptive species like crossbills, right? They often breed sort of based on what wind resources, resources are available. So if you get a lot of say pine cones, right? That they feed on in the environment that's like, okay, there's food, let's eat, let's breed, right? And so there's different cues depending on the type of species that you are. Um, and so we have to, so it's really complicated then with global change, how species respond. And some are um, sort of maybe better able to cope. And in fact, in conservation, there's sort of this use of the term winners and losers, right? With climate change. And so some species are winners they are figuring out how to persist. Maybe they're better at shifting their range. Maybe they have sort of pre-adaptations that allow them to deal with these changes or, or maybe make them less uh, sensitive, more buffered to the change. Uh, and then losers are ones that are just not doing well, right? So it's really controversial. Like, do you put your money behind the winners? Right. I'm yes. I don't, I don't, <laughs> that is it's a it's a it's a it's a difficult conversation that people are having because funding is limited. Right. So do you put yeah. more resources into the ones that are struggling or do you do you just kind of uh, let some of those right. go because there's only so much that can be done. Right. And uh, nature is taking its course in some way. A new right. Form of nature. Right, right. And, and the, you know, and of course, the response to that is that, well, yes, extinction does happen, but the rate at which extinction is happening now is unprecedented, right? It's so rapid. And we have such huge overturn that that's going to have major knock on effects on just how ecosystems are organized and function. And so, yes, if we were losing things here and there, you know, ecosystems manage, they, you know, they deal, the function is maintained. But if you have huge losses, right, that can really have changes that you can't necessarily deal with, right? You have huge shifts in whole landscapes in response. So weighty issues. <laughs> and potentially yeah. birds that are far more particular, like say your sparrows right. that are very particular in the, in the type of regional accent that they have. So mm -hmm. they're probably not straying nearly as far as... Uh, what, what, what's something that gets around and is more adaptive? Would like a mimic fall into that category or something? Yeah, or that... like we see things like some species are doing like tree swallows and other species that I study here are really interesting because they're one of the few whose range is shifting south as it gets warmer, right? So most species ranges are shifting north, right? The populations are declining in the south and growing in northern latitudes and they're doing the opposite. They're actually going the other way. And so you see the you sort of uncover these um, maybe tolerances for things like rising temperatures that you didn't know, we didn't know about before, right? And so that can show you that some may be better adapted or better able to adjust, yeah. And, and now that the many other species of birds are leaving, yeah. birds that are uh, resilient can exploit this, right. uh, all of these, uh, they, they have all of the, uh, the worms to themselves. Right. Competitive release. Right. Yes. So you suddenly have, for example, bluebirds, right? They don't do as well in heat. So is it, is this, is this shift in part because you're able to deal with rising temperatures and also probably like you said, because space is opening up that ni that niche space is opening up the yeah. resilient birds get the worm a resilient bird gets the worm that's right <laughs> um so um what role does uh, do these sparrows that you're study uh, that you study what role do they have in the ecosystem so so we get to listen to their wonderful song and everything else but if i'm if i'm uh uh you know sticking funding into uh, keeping these sparrows alive. Mm -hmm. What am I getting out of it? If, if, if all the sparrows yeah. go away, is there these downstream effects and the whole, the whole ecosystem mm -hmm. eventually collapse because collapses because yeah. of insects start overrunning and then they like kill too many plants. And then this whole uh, yeah. domino effect happens or yeah. Unfortunately, not with my little white crown sparrow. They're not, they're they not, don't like, matter. They're not, they don't matter. <laughs> <laughs> they're not a keystone. Um, but you know, there's really cool work um, on 
this sort of idea, because one of the questions you alluded to earlier was, well, if they can respond to noise, right? If, if, if birds can respond and adjust, then are there actually any fitness consequences? Does that actually affect, po could that be one of the things affecting population decline, right? And so to go back to that question, um, Jesse Barber and Clinton Francis have done the last couple of years, especially this huge amount of beautiful work showing that things like road noise, road networks, you know, not just thinking about cities, but right, like our whole, um, just look, look, look at the United States, right? They came out with a noise map, the United States, and all, even what we think of as undisturbed, sort of the rural West, right, is hugely um, fragmented by noise, by roads, by airports, and that this has had fitness consequences across many species of birds. So they just beautiful comparative analysis showing um, direct declines in offspring survival and breeding and populations across many different species of birds. And so, and many of those are important in their ecosystem, sort of play key roles. And you see these sort of turnovers in communities where you lose a number of bird species and you see a shift in that composition, right? And so they're doing some really cool work at that ecosystem level. How does sound act as an axis of ecological niche, right? Which people hadn't really thought of before. Sound is an important part of that. That's a whole new area of research that's really exciting, I think. So say there's what's really noisy, an airport. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so Planes, you planes, yeah, yeah. So yeah. you you have this airport mm -hmm. that um, that that now a lot of species are uh, having a difficult time um, uh, getting their getting their song as far or mm -hmm. doing it within that sexy range that we all know and love mm -hmm. by this point, and. It, so they're probably they're maybe migrating away from uh, this area in some cases. Are are there then some species of bird that are taking advantage of that new? Uh, uh, what, what was the um, what was the competition term that you used? Oh, competitive the, release. Yeah. The, the taking advantage of yeah. the competitive release yep. and and moving in there. They are, are there are there birds that have that potentially have kind of less selection pressure on mm -hmm. their song, like um, Bowerbird comes to mind. I know they have song right. and everything, but, but some other thing that females are able to evaluate, some other, some other costly signal where you right. can show off your fitness and, and those birds would maybe do better in a around an airport right. where there isn't as much competition. Yeah. So you are seeing some of that and that's that shift also. And, and I mean, that's one thing to always remember. I was, I try to, you know, when I talking to my students about environmental disturbance and behavior is that environment, things like light pollution, noise pollution, chemical, all these things that we can think of habitat fragmentation, they can disrupt behavioral systems like communication, you know, reproduction, foraging, predator avoidance, right? Anything you can think of that's going to affect fitness and survival, right? Disrupting that behavioral system, but behavior also solves problems, right? And so you see selection acting on things like females, like you just said, if you can no longer get the relevant information, if making a choice based on say sound alone is not yielding great fitness, then you see selection against those females. And instead, females that maybe use other modalities, right? Like, for example, visual signals are going to do better. So, you know, you have to sort of think about in a species what how much variation there is. So if you have females who do use those other modalities, you can have selection for that. And you can see within a species that change in behavior, right? That adjustment. But other some species might not have that variation, right? So it really comes down to to evolve, you got to have the variation to act on. Yeah. So you might have a color or, of course, mm -hmm. the famous uh, peacock plumage right. is, is a great way. Or, or even just something as unsexy as the little black and white crown and the white crown sparrow. How contrasty are your white stripes versus your black stripes? You don't even need to have color, right? So they can use other sorts of like visual information, for mm. example. I mean that sounds pretty sexy to me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, what, what about what? What's the uh, what's the turkey thing with Thanksgiving's coming up at the time that yeah. we're uh, yeah. the not the gizzard the little the, waddle. The, 
Yeah. Do you know what that's called? Um, yeah. It's, it's a, isn't it the waddle? Is it a waddle? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's what I think of it as. Yeah. yeah. That, so that, I'm that's, sure there's a technical term that I should be using, but I just think of it as a little, as a, as a waddle. Oh, that's just how you yeah. think of it. No, yeah. there's a definitely a technical <laughs> term. Um, for turkey specifically. Yeah. Yeah. For that weird yeah. nose thing, beak thing. Um, cause, cause that, uh, that's, uh, that, that has some, uh, the, the, the gene for its length yeah. is, is, um, is, is very close to, um, some of the genes for, uh, immune system health. Ah, and, and so, so neat. like, uh, ac- accidentally females have yeah. stumbled on, yeah. you know, kind of, well, everything's kind of accidental when it comes yeah. to evolution, but yeah. have, have some, so, so there's kind of a correlation to the, yeah. because you look at this thing and that's, it's like, it's gross. It's not it's symmetrical. Not, yeah. It's like, it's not strong. It's like this weird flappy, like, yeah. uh, but it, it's, it happens to be conferring information about, uh, about immune health. And, yep. and, and, and so, so there may be just like peculiar things like that, that, uh, yeah. that, that, females because there's probably i imagine in a lot of species there there's a number of of traits females are evaluating so you just get one kinky lady that happens to look for um uh foot size or something like that instead and then and then that that just happening to have a preference for that suddenly in this new shifting environment Mm -hmm. happens to confer more um, a, a, a better fitness mm-hmm. single than a uh, signal than, than the, uh, bird song did. Um, and now that maybe takes off in the population where, where she has, uh, daughters that look for that and, yes. and sons, and who, have sons who have that. Yep. Yep. Mm. The sexy son. Yeah, no, I think that's totally, I mean, I, you know, it's funny. You think of turkeys as not that sexy, but they do have a lot of the dances that they do. Do you yeah, know the whole a lot story? Going on, they, well, because yeah, they, they got a plumage, they got yes. the, yeah, and then yeah. they have the, the, the weird beak gross thing that <laughs> ladies like. But no, well, tell me they, the story. And they dance together, so brothers, you know, oh, they relatives. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, okay. They'll dance. They'll do performances together, and if you. If you are with a team, you have you get high, you know more female attention than if you're by yourself. But if you're with a team and you're not the dominant one, you don't get anything, right? So yeah. like, how do you? People think of that as an altruistic behavior. So how do you have? How does that evolve, right? If you if you're losing out and not having any fitness, it's because mm. your genes, your shared genes, right, with that relative. So it works if you're. Um, dancing with a close relative. And if you go out and look at turkey pairs that are dancing males together, they are close relatives. Do they ever have, do they ever form friendships instead? Like, Hey, come on. Like <laughs> you, you know, it would be because you get the, yeah. the, the brother thing. But if, but if you need to be in a league to yeah. have a shot at females, there, there must be, there must be yeah. some only children out there that, that, <laughs> that you're just screwed. Up. No. Well, in mannequins, you see that, right. You do see some, um, a cooperative dancing where they're not close relatives. So it's not sort of Hamilton's rule, right? It's not kin selection that's driving it, but instead they sort of uh, like a take turn or you inherit that spot. So like you basically think of it like an intern, like you're putting up with it. You don't get anything out of it, but when the, when the guy retires or dies, right, you get his spot. So you inherit that spot Mm. um, as another way of sort of benefiting. Like why would you cooperate if you're not, if you're not getting any, right? So like you will, if you get to inherit that spot in the dance, that's, that's a story behind some of the mannequins that, you know, pop around and do their really fun, complicated dances. Well, I, I know this isn't necessarily a research, but now you've yeah. opened up this, this tangent that I, I'm going to, <laughs> yeah. Uh, now I have a lot of questions, but so, so you, you get together with your, with your brothers and, uh, uh, these are called leaks, right? I'm, I'm saying. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, and in 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 you can have different kinds. So yes. Yes. So like when, if you have females coming to sample, right. And you got a bunch of males sort of displaying together. Yes. Right. Yeah. So, so you yeah. can call it a lek or a leak, people, lek. but people okay. pronounce it differently. So, they, yeah. they do. Is there, yes. is there a winner? Well, I think it's partly in academia and I could elect. 
Uh, academics okay. say yeah, Lex. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. I'm going to yeah. say Lex so yeah. I can fit in. Okay. Come um, on down. <laughs> I, uh, so, so you line up with your brothers. Yeah. I, I, well, I was just kind of thinking that, uh, so in that case is, is the, is the larger the luck, the more females that it's potentially going to draw in? Yeah. So that's a, you're just, you're just hitting on all sorts of hypotheses. I feel like you're an evolutionary biologist at heart here. Oh, I you love just got to let it out. <laughs> it's one of my favorite topics. Wait, Cause then, yeah. you know, cause the whole, the, it's the conundrum of the luck, right? Like why would you go hang out with your competitors? Right? Like there's a, right. And so there's many hypotheses. Why? So in the turkeys, it's usually just, two, maybe three. So there's small display groups, but things like sage grouse, right? I don't know if you know Gail Patricelli's work on sage grouse. Mm. Oh my God, it's really good. She builds these little fembots. They're female robotic sage grouse yeah. that she drives around. I bet they don't around. need to be that good. I bet, I bet yeah, the, the males are take probably much. all it's over true. those things. Yeah. <laughs> Just some feathers stuck to a little yeah. thing on a track. Yeah, um, a, a, a little... Yeah. R- race car with a plumage on yeah, it. Yeah, they're really cool. But it. they have really sophisticated microphone arrays and video cameras so that she can figure out because the males actually position themselves very strategically to boom the female, right? With these displays that they make, the sounds that they make. Um mm-hmm. it sounds very directional. So she's like kind of figured out the physics of that orientation. But the lek thing, right? So there's a lot of different hypotheses for why there are leks. You know, one is sort of the um, the sort of group, right? The more you get, like you just said, if you got a bunch, you're just females can find you easier in the landscape. Well, you know? also, yeah, there's I mean, three. You, so I'll see if you get. I'll see if you could like just stumble across these hypotheses on your own. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, I, I would think if you have more brothers, yeah. that's an indicator yeah. of of fitness potentially. That's interesting. As, as I never well. thought about that. Uh, I mean, I mean, yeah. it, because there's yeah. there's. Uh, there's different rates of mm-hmm. fecancy with, yeah. within uh, in, there's individual variants in fecancy. And yes. so if, if you would, even though it's the males, you'd still be queuing in and some yeah. genes from the, from the mother's uh, ability to uh, have more offspring. Right. And, Are you and successful? Yeah. And that might be the case in turkeys. You know, I don't know if anybody's asked that question and other like, you don't have necessarily relatives like sage grouse or hummingbirds, like these mannequin legs, like you don't necessarily have close relatives, right? So but that makes you're it even able more to form of a coalitions. Yes, too, right? That's a right. that's an interesting Are you welcome thing into to the pat- Yeah, can you be a part of the men's club? Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> if, if you have if you're if you're having that sexy son, yeah. that's also if you're having the popular son, and uh, that that knows uh, you know that, that wearing. The Nike swoosh around yes. <laughs> in middle school is just the coolest thing you it's, can do yep. in this particular middle school, and they're very socially savvy, yeah, and can form larger leagues. So that's yeah. that's cueing into yeah. some information. That's true, right? And it also, you know, they think another reason might be that Lex kind of go where the females are, right? So they that's why you get a male congregation is that it's a sort of a emergent property of just a bunch of individual males trying to like go where females typically fly or walk or like sort of their patterns are near, say a really good food resource, right? You kind of congregate where the female is. You all kind of happen to get there. It wasn't for, you know what I mean? Like it's not intentional. It's just each going there and it forms this bigger group. So then you you would think, so then if you're, if you're just, well, this, this is making it, I'm, I'm, clearly the best male around I, so i would want as many males as as possible lined up um next to me to be like look it's obvious look yeah. at what i have well flip it on. around right it's well that's the exactly sexy, then that's yeah. the conundrum if yes. you're if you're the loser why even well, waste the energy except if that if you get if you hang out with the sexy stud if you're the wingman yeah, right yeah. of the sexy stud then maybe you get the female who didn't who's waiting her turn, right? right you have to, right, so the female right. has to move through this group of males. So you tend to, so that's the third hypothesis is that it forms, lex form because males will congregate around the sexy stud, right? And so that then they get sort of, they get more opportunities to mate than if they were off on their own because that 
that male is attracting the females in. Are there any like are are females always selecting or uh, is is there? <laughs> that's the other. That's another I'm good like, question. That's a whole other line I, of research. I'm, yeah, <laughs> which is good. I'm thinking of the scientific word. Right. Uh, I see. I, I know what you mean. Are there some more choosy than others? Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, is, is I mean, are or is there um um. Is there coercion at all within within males? Where oh, yeah. where one of the guys that isn't being slept no. because what what is it the um uh it's not coital kiss I'm close yeah. to it though yeah what, yeah, what's yeah. The, yeah is so, it coital kiss yep yep that's right oh okay yeah yeah, yeah. so this coital kiss you yeah. just press these holes yeah. together yeah. quick yeah. you're yeah. you're in it's and really out fast. You'd, yeah. You'd, you'd think yeah. there'd be maybe a little selection for a little, you get a little sneak in there. Yes, quick that's there's... true. And that's true. And females, actually, there's internal selection. So females can take in sperm from multiple males and then select after which they use. In a whole clutch or can you? Cause yes, I, cause even in a clutch. Yeah. Even within a clutch? Mm-hmm. So, so, so you, you, you can. Maternity. Yep. Okay, so you can yeah. have, uh, yeah, so you, you can. So you see this evolve in systems where there's all more of your, coercion, right? All of your egg basket in one male. Exactly. Okay. So, yes, yeah, so you can see like in systems where, in species where there's an evolution of sort of greater rates of male coercion, right? You see selection for these sort of hidden forms of female selection, mm. right? That they can still exert a choice. So it, it, it like it, insects will have this where mm-hmm. they'll have uh, you know some damsel fly or mm-hmm. something will have thousands of male uh, partners or something yeah. sometimes and and all of these different chambers and store yes. things around uh, yeah. away and then be like oh let's let's try uh, chamber uh, four thirty seven yeah, yeah. and you like kind of see like. Yeah. They seem like they're doing okay. Yeah, yeah. Let's, it's pretty let's remarkable, try 689. Huh? Yeah. And I'm like, whoa, yeah. 689 <laughs> seems like it's doing pretty well yeah. in this particular environment. So, but uh, I guess coercion makes, so coercion, you can kind of, uh, the, the male thinks, uh, or, or it's probably not thinking. I know this is hard. This, this is one but, of the things you start talking right, about right, behavior. Right, right, yeah. Right, right. The, the sort of the uh, yeah. anthropomorphizing is, is easy to do. Right. Uh, but, yes. but, 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 yeah. but f- females that are, uh, coerced mm-hmm. in, into, uh, uh, by, by a male that they're not, uh, as interested in mm-hmm. or, or selecting, um, can potentially store some of that sperm mm-hmm. away and and some or discard it after the fact that's right and it's an arms so, race but but is there also is is there uh is there selection pressure of because i know there's what some uh, often like 10 to 20 percent cuck holding rates within mm-hmm. a, a lot of different species is there yes birds it, are very um profligate yes yeah so yes. Is, is there is there also I guess going back to these leaks, if you have the uh, the the like weird like kind of the, the guy that doesn't have the the big plumage or or whatever, but once in a while the female will be like, I'll pick him just in case there's some weird thing, yeah. because there's uh, the environment's always changing, so so you don't know one one day having a yeah. uh, a larger offspring might have some benefit um in the next generation having smaller offspring might make yeah. them um uh less susceptible to predation or mm-hmm. something like that so so it's it's it, it's hard to identify good or bad within yeah. um an evolutionary no, true, right? context and, and so you see a lot of people <laughs> folks that study female preferences right that's sort of an ongoing conundrum is 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 looking at individual variation right because you don't necessarily have situations there's not that many traits for which all females prefer right so we we sort of see um we can look at the strength of the preference and that individual variation to how sharp the preference curve is like you're, that's kind of what you're alluding to which is you know is it that it's only the reddest male that i'm going to go for or do you see some females that sort of have a broader range because there's potential there that could be selectively advantageous 
to be less choosy, right? Or less specific in your choice because that opens up the number of possible males you could mate with, right? Because you don't want to not mate. That'd be bad. But it also maybe means that if you're in a very like um, rapidly fluctuating environment, right? Really unstable, that it may really vary year to year, which, off, you know, what traits you want your offspring to have. And so you can see different solutions to that. Like maybe it's having sort of a variable preference, or maybe it's um, mating with lots of different males. And so you have sort of a, like you said, lots of different potential genotypes, right? And you can see, you know, hopefully at least one of them does well in the upcoming environment. So I think there's a lot of different, you know, females are the gatekeepers, right? They're the gatekeepers of breeding. And so there's a lot of interesting selection pressures and ways they've solved that, you know, how to, how to do that. Yeah. Um, so what, what's, what's some of your main work at the moment? Okay. Yeah. So I, I really, I, I alluded earlier about sort of thinking about how, um, environments disrupt behaviors, right. But then also how behaviors can solve these environmental challenges. And so I'm really interested recently in thinking about how, um, animals use behaviors to deal with like rising temperatures. So in tree swallows here locally, um, with a group of undergraduates, it's been sort of a passion project that started during COVID because I couldn't go do field work and I was going crazy at home with two small children and we put up nest boxes. So that was my solution. So we put up nest boxes, recruited a whole population of tree swallows and started looking at how um, individuals deal with heat. So things like, you know, um, you know, uh, panting, right. To get rid of heat, to dissipate heat, wings spreading, standing tall, um, finding sort of cooler micro sites, um, to deal with, uh, you know, heat load. And so all of these different behaviors are ways to sort of slow down or, um, reduce physiological responses because, you know, an organismal damage, right. So the sort of the first, the, the front line of defense against temperature, and some individuals do this, have different strategies. So I'm really interested in this because people have known for a long time that these behaviors are important, right? They've been studied. We know panting's important. It's not, that's not exciting. What is exciting is to think about the fact that individuals really vary. So even within the same nest, chicks are doing different things to deal with heat. Say on a hot day when the nest box gets hot, they do different things to deal with that. Like some may let their body temperature go up. Some may pant a lot and, you know, use evaporative water cooling, right, to, to cool themselves down. And we don't know anything about that individual variation. We don't know how it, you know, how it works. We don't know sort of the fitness consequences of it, right? What, what's the, what, how they're dealing with those trade-offs. And so that's my, my most recent work is, is thinking about that, those kinds of behaviors, which is new for me because I've always done communication and song. And so this is a departure. And I, and I think it's in part because I really believe that behavior is how animals solve environmental problems. And so to understand how birds are dealing with climate change and global change, we need to know about those behaviors. And behavioral biologists kind of have avoided that to a certain extent. They're not as involved as say physiologists and climate modelers and understanding how, you know, species are responding to heat waves and rising, you know, global temperatures and we need to get involved. <laughs> so that's what I'm, that's sort of my, my most recent work that I'm doing. Very cool. Um, and can you talk a little bit about, um, Nimbios as we, or Nimbus? Yeah, I know. As, right. Is it Nimbus? Is it Nimbios? Spe yeah. Speaking of, uh, <laughs> things we're up in the air about. Uh, and it affects and communication, right? You need to have a clear signal and that yeah. different name is challenging, but I always call it Nimbus. So I'll say Nimbus. So Nimbus is going through a really, um, interesting shift right now. Set, uh, can you set yeah. up what Nimbus is? Yes. Yeah, so it's the National Institute of Mathematical and Biological Synthesis is what it stands for. And it's been around for 20 plus years now. And it's become internationally recognized because when it was started, it did a really good job of bringing people together, right? Bringing together mathematicians and biologists and saying, okay, here's some space, here's some time, here's some money, the things that researchers love, space, time, money, work together, right? follow your ideas, you know, do sort of, um, interesting new synthesis of work. Right. And that was 
really well received, right? So Nimbus has done a beautiful job over time building sort of math and bio collaborations. Recently, um, it's starting to pivot, right? So it's pivoted how it's, it's focused because it's done such a good job doing that. Now we need something new, right? So now it's developing the infrastructure to bring mathematicians and biologists together to do, to give them the tools to do sort of transdisciplinary and transformative work. And how do I explain this? It's more a matter of not saying, okay, you know what you're doing. Here's some space, time, and money. Instead it's saying, hey, you know, if you come and work with us, we have different ways of looking at things. Mathematicians are really good at looking at systems and looking for rules, right? Um, and so come, you may not even know what you want to do, but talk about your work with us and we will help give you the tools to do new and interesting work, right? And so as part of that, we are building um, different ways to work with researchers to support their research and also their broader impacts. And that's kind of what I do at Nimbus. So I'm the Associate Director of Outreach. And so I work with people to think about how to communicate their science, which I know you do too, and thinking about ways that we do that. So we do it along a, a number of different axes. So um, things like, you know, how do you communicate with the public and working with you, right? We do that. Um, we also think about how to make science easy as play. So we have an easiest play component to our work where we work with faculty to build hands-on science and mathematic uh, uh, educational materials. So for example, we just did a really fun, the Math and Nature badge series with the local Girl Scouts uh, troops. Um, and we, you know, had mathematicians come and do, you know, and biologists come and do all the sort of activities that the Girl Scouts needed to do to to earn their their three badges, which was really fun. We just did that a couple of weeks ago, um, and we just do also we think about um, just we also just sort of talk to researchers because they often don't have time to think about that broader impacts. They're not trained in that component, right? And it's becoming more and more important, not just for funding agencies, but also because people are worried, right? Global change is happening and people want to know, how is this going to affect me? How do I respond? So scientists have this really important job that they don't know, always have the tools to do well. So Nimbus can help with that. We can help with how to increase the impact of your work. So you can find out more in the description of the show. We'll have some more links and, and do you, where would you like to direct people for your work specifically? For my research? Yeah. yeah so you can visit my website too. So there's the, the Dairyberry Lab has a website at, at UT on our, on our work. Dairyberry Lab. All you got to remember is best to last name ever. <laughs> and then the word lab after it. And yep. you'll be able to find that very easily. Uh, we, we do need to close one uh, yes. little loose end. Okay. The three theories for leaks. Yes. Lex. Yes. Yes. I'm an academic now. I'm a science. Yes. I'm an official science communicator. I yeah. say, I, mean, I say, if the public says leak more, then um, I know. See, this is exactly the kind of reasons we need to collaborate and talk to each other because yeah. it's real, right? Especially when I work with uh, science teachers, science educators, K through twelve science educators, they will use words differently, and it's like, well, how do we how do we resolve that, right? Because mm -hmm. there isn't really a right way, right? The Language right way is, evolving. is how to, how does it best communicate to the children, right? How do they learn it? So yeah, what is it? Hot spot, hot shot, and just how many are you? Those are the three. So you're in a hot spot where females go, are you a hot shot? So you like to be near the sexy guy, or is it just a numbers game? The more you got, the, the more impressive the lack, the more okay. females that will come. Those are the three. The three could hypothesis. Put another hot in there. Hold I on know. A second. I know. We should think of that. That's, okay. I think we of got. That. <laughs> uh, what's the third one again? The non hot Just, one. Just do you have a lot of them? Do you have a lot of males? Your number of individuals. The hot lot. The hot lot. Ooh, I like that. 
hot spot, hot shot, hot uh, lot. Uh, I'll try that when I teach animal behavior next. I'll try it out. I see, mean, I'll see how many eyes roll when how I do it. How do you it. not? <laughs> I know it is I cheesy. Do some, I do get some For good sure, eye rolls in my classes. Can, yeah, <laughs> throw an eye roll in. Uh, I'm a teenager. That's okay. I'm yeah, getting used to it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, everything's cringe with oh, teenagers. Oh, it is. Yes, so it is. Mom is mom. so embarrassing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, kids get your name or? Yeah, Liz. Yep. Oh, they love Dairy Berry. They, yes. they got yes. Dairy Berry? Yes. Yeah, I'm a Girl that's... Scout leader and their favorite thing. No, no. Your children. Oh, Are my they dairy children. Berries? Oh, no. They're Blums. Really? We did. You Blummed them? Yeah, we blummed them. We did think about the combo name of Blumberry, and we thought oh, that's just wow. maybe mean. <laughs> so they're I blums. Mean, I don't know. Yes. I, I, I think mean <laughs> was depriving your children of dairy. It's true. Berry. It was a long conversation that we had about whether what to do. And I, I it was actually me. My husband thought dairy berry was better, and I was like, I want plum. You know, uh, no. So. Okay, well, <laughs> we all make mistakes. Yep. Um, I mean, more traditional than I realize. <laughs> um, all right. Well, thank you so much, Liz, for joining me on the show. This is a fantastic talk. Yeah. Uh, I, I love any time I get to talk about evolutionary biology and birds are so fascinating. So this is a really terrific episode. So thank you so much. And thank you, listeners, for being such wonderful, curious people. We'll talk with you next week.